Good morning, everyone. My name is Michelle and I'll be your webinar moderator today. Today's webinar on subcontractor terminations is sponsored by Natrod's platinum partner, Ampol. Ampol is Australia's leading transport energy distributor and retailer. Their infrastructure, international footprint, supply chain expertise, deep customer relationships, iconic brand and 8,300 passionate people underpin Ampol's position as Australia's leading supplier of mobile energy and provocative volatility. Today's webinar is pr being presented by Nigel Ward, CEO of Australian Business Lawyers and Advisors. Nigel is one of Australia's leading advocates and practitioners in employee and industrial relations with more than 30 years of strategic business planning experience. ABLA is a leading firm in owner driver management and negotiation, specializing in this, this complex field, having negotiated owner driver arrangements across Australia. They also conduct specialized training courses on this subject. Their approach to all legal issues is from a what's best for your business perspective. Like always, we'd love to hear from you during today's presentation. If you have a question, please feel free to type it in, type in your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll be answering the questions at the end of the session. So welcome everyone and over to you, Nigel. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. And um, I should thank your sponsor, Ampol, to start with as well. Look, today's session uh, arose because Nat Road had a number of issues with certain members around a number of owner driver obligations, principally in New South Wales, although we had some conversations about some particular obligations in Victoria. And so my purpose today is to try and make sure people are fully aware of some of these obligations, uh, how they apply, what they require, uh, and to make sure that people are planning ahead if they're making changes in their business that might trigger these obligations. So that's, that's really the purpose of today. Um, feel, feel free to get in touch with me through Nat Roads if, if you want to at the end of this. Um, drop me an email. I'm more than happy to have a chat uh, with uh, Nat Road members at any time. I just want to start by um, putting this in context, particularly for those people who might have less knowledge of the owner driver regulation space. Um, if I was to spend an entire day with you, I would probably take you through all of these parts of the legal system in Australia because in some form or fashion, all of these parts of the legal system in Australia do actually touch on owner driver arrangements. I'm really gonna focus very heavily today on something that is relevant to the New South Wales system uh, and uh, owner drivers in New South Wales. And I'm gonna touch right at the end of the day, very briefly on something in the Victorian system. So, so for those people who uh, live in Western Australia, um, uh, I apologise, but um, for those people operating in New South Wales and Victoria, today will be particularly relevant. So let's just start with the New South Wales system, and I'll give, I'm going to give a quick overview to make sure people are comfortable with it before I get into the sort of the meat of today's topic. Um, the Victoria, the New South Wales system covers two forms of contractual arrangement. Um, the, the one at the bottom is called a contract of bailment. And most of you don't need to worry about that ever. Um, it's a very, it's a very old-fashioned uh, form of contract, and it's most common in the taxi industry. And it's effectively where somebody owns an asset, and they, for want of a better way of putting it, lend the asset to that person on the basis that they share in the risk and reward. So if I owned a taxi, I might give that taxi uh, to a, a taxi driver and say, look, uh, you drive it to today and uh, I'll take 40% of what you earn and you can keep 60. And that would be a classic bailment contract. But, but I'm not really interested in those for today's topic. I'm interested in the notion that's at the top, this notion of contracts of carriage uh, and how they work in the New South Wales system. So let's have a look at what a contract of carriage is. Essentially, the New South Wales industrial relations system regulates a particular class of subcontract driver, and they are subcontract drivers involved in what are called contracts of carriage, as you'll see on the screen there. Uh, this is where your, your owner driver is working for you, and that owner driver is in the business of transportation of goods by means of a motor vehicle or bicycle, particularly relevant to the courier sector. 
in the course of a business of transporting goods of that kind by motor vehicle or bicycle. And you can fall into this definition if you are operating in one of three legal structures. So if you were a sole trader, that is Bob Smith with an ABN, and I, I own my truck and I'm engaged by you as my principal to cut concrete or whatever it might be, um, then I could fall under this definition. If I'm a partnership and I'm in that situation and one of the partners is driving that vehicle on a regular basis, I would fall under this definition. And most relevantly in the modern era, uh, you would be what I would call a mum and dad company, a small company. And uh, if a director or a family member is driving the vehicle, then that company would be a contract carrier performing contracts of carriage in the new civil system. So let me put that into context. Um, uh, I'm, I'm Smith's Transport and I engage some subcontract drivers and uh, Bob comes along, Bob owns a truck, it's a, uh, a rigid um, and Bob operates through a little proprietary limited company, we'll call that Bob Proprietary Limited. Bob is a uh, director of that company along with his wife and Bob is the driver of that truck. Bob Proprietary Limited driving that truck would be a contract carrier and covered by this New South Wales system. Um, so the, the first thing we always need to do with these systems is work out who's in and who's out. So that's that's the important thing about who's in. Um, and obviously the principal contractor would be the, 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 the person who's, who's the hirer, the person who's engaging that truck. And just be conscious that the New South Wales system is a little sneaky because it extends to people who are agents uh, for those types of vehicles. So you sometimes can see people operating these sort of panels where they uh, engage uh, these people on behalf of somebody. It is possible that they might actually be construed as an agent and therefore they could be a principal contractor engaging these contract carriers. So that, that's how you fall into this system. Now the system itself is, is pretty complicated. I'm not gonna deal with it today. It'll be for another day. But importantly, um, under this system, uh, the New South Wales Industrial Relations Commission creates documents which are called contract determinations. They have statutory force. So they're a statutory instrument. They legally apply. You can be sued if you don't comply with them. Uh, you can be taken to the New South Wales Commission in dispute proceedings if you're not complying with them. Um, and the contract determinations uh, is quite a broad number of them. I'm going to spend most of the day talking about one in particular, but our focus today is, are you in the system? Are you covered by the contract terminations? And you'll see that I've highlighted the one down the bottom, and I will spend most of today's presentation talking about the one down the bottom because that's the one which um, Nat Road, some of Nat Road's members recently rubbed up against. But before I get to that, um, there's um, about a dozen or so industry-wide contract determinations in New South Wales. Probably the most relevant one for members of Nat Roads is going to be the general carriers contract determination. This is a contract determination that, uh, subject to certain provisions, applies across New South Wales but it doesn't apply generally. Uh, it applies in what's called the County of Cumberland, which we'll now call in the modern era, Greater Sydney, which is basically sort of Camden all the way up to Windsor, out to Penrith. It applies to all contracts of carriage by contract carriers in that area. It also applies in various radiuses. So if your contract carrier is only uh, operating within 50 kilometres of the start point, it would have an application there. And it has some uh, limited application in places like around the Newcastle area. But um, this is a general contract determination broadly applying to uh, all work done by uh, general uh, rigids, uh, some semi-trailer work and the like. Doesn't cover specialist cartage, 
So it doesn't cover things like um, uh, courier work. It doesn't carry, uh, cover quarry materials. It doesn't cover excavated materials work or concrete and like. But just, just be aware that that document's there. It was uh, modernised uh, quite extensively over about a three to four year period uh, quite recently. It has uh, statutory enforceable cartage rates for different classes of vehicle. Um, so that contract determination is sitting there. Uh, you need to be aware of how that operates and applies. There's then a variety of specialist contract determinations in New South Wales, probably the most relevant one after the general carriers one to members of Nat Roads is going to be the courier and taxi truck one, which by its name covers courier and taxi vehicles. And we're predominantly here talking about smaller uh, size vehicles. They're all under uh, 4.5 ton GVM. It also covers motorbikes in the courier industry and bicycles in the courier industry. And again, it's got statutory enforceable cartage rates as well as other terms and conditions. And probably slightly less relevant for members of Nat Road, but I just raised them anyway. There is then a group of specialist determinations, one covering quarried materials, one covering concrete. There's also one covering excavated materials. So just be conscious that if you're operating with owner drivers in New South Wales and they fall into those definitions I talked about earlier, there is a very high likelihood that one of these documents is going to apply and it's going to set statutory enforceable conditions that you need to be aware of and understand how you're complying with. Which brings us to this interesting one. There is a contract determination in New South Wales, which technically speaking is called the Transport Industry Redundancy State Contract Determination. And um, Sadly, this is one that is not as well known, but has very wide application, which we're going to talk about. And it creates obligations for principal contractors engaging owner drivers in circumstances where they're introducing major change in their business. And it also gives rise to an obligation in certain situations to pay to owner drivers redundancy pay based on a particular formula. So it's, it's quite an important determination to understand its operation, particularly in circumstances why, where you might be making changes to your fleet or, or the uh, be that the composition of your fleet, be that the fleet mix that you're operating with between uh, owner drivers, uh, larger fleet owners, uh, company vehicles, or in circumstances where you might be reducing your fleet due to, say, uh, economic downturn. And uh, at the moment, it's very difficult to get a truck for love and the money, uh, given uh, the uh, labour supply in this country. But obviously, as uh, uh, the current economic situation takes hold, um, we are possibly going to be facing some level of downturn in this country. So this document's probably going to become relevant at some point in your lives. Uh, so let's go through it in some detail and we'll, we'll take our time with this because it is a little bit complicated. So this is the redundancy state contract determination in New South Wales. Who does it apply to? Uh, well, let's start at the very beginning. Um, it's worded so that it applies to all contract carriers, all principal contractors, undertaking contracts of carriage. So again, if you think about that definition we talked about earlier, I'm the hirer, uh, Bob owns a truck and is uh, the driver and he's providing the truck to me or Bob Proprietary Limited and Bob's the director and they're providing the truck. Uh, that, would, that would capture you under this document. There are a couple of uh, carve outs from its application where they say it doesn't apply. Um, uh, the one that we first come to, which is under the uh, numeral two, is, I have to be honest, and people hate it when people like me say this, it, it's appallingly worded and it is susceptible to many uh, definitions, but um, uh, the primary uh, carve out here or the exclusion from this document applying to you would be if you engage less than 15 employees and carriers 
in total immediately prior to the termination of engagement of a carrier for reasons arising from changes in production program organization structure and technology now i'm going to come back to some of those words as we go through today particularly those words about changes in production but but i want most of you to think about this um, it's very unusual this this test but if if you in, employ and engage 15 employees uh, and carriers um, uh, less than that, then I don't want you to stress about this document. There is an argument that you should be complying with one small part of it, but the probably the most important part, which is the redundancy payment part, you would definitely be out of. Now, um, uh, you, you would see there that the words employees and carriers are combined. Uh, so if you were Nigel Ward Proprietary Limited, uh, I would need to count how many employees Nigel Ward Proprietary Limited has. I would need to count how many contract carriers Nigel Ward Proprietary Limited engages. And if the combined number is less than 15, uh, then uh, this document uh, has no application or at the very least, very limited application as I'll go through further on. So there is a sort of get out of jail free for what we might call those very small operators to begin with. It also expressly doesn't apply in situations where you terminate an owner driver for reasons that justify instant dismissal. And there's some delightful old language in the document from the 1950s, which is said to include malingering, inefficiency or neglect of duty. Um, that, that, that language dates back to the Second World War. So it shows you how uh, modern this document uh, really is and how it was drafted. Um, I, what I want you to think of there is uh, situations where um, the conduct of the carrier is so serious that it justifies tearing up their contract on the spot. Um, now, in employment terms, we might use language like serious misconduct. Uh, in uh, contract terms, we might use language like material breach or fundamental breach, serious and persistent breach of contract. But we're really there talking about conduct that's right at the high end, which really justifies instantly ripping the contract up. And I think most people probably would have a handle about that. So bottom line is this, this document applies to all contracts of carry all contract carriers or principals there are two immediate exclusions which get you out of jail free um, but let's assume for the rest of today that um, the 15 employee and carrier uh, get out of jail free card doesn't apply let's assume that um, i'm uh, operating a business that uh, employs or engages collectively more than 15 employees and carriers and I'm going to be making some changes to my fleet. And that's the presumption I want you to make at the moment. There's three terms that you're going to hear me use a lot to, today, and they're really important to get your mind around. One is engagement. That is the engagement of a carrier. And again, there's a little bit of a kind of get out of jail free card with that. Um, uh, if we're dealing here with uh, a carrier who is... Uh, engaged for regular or systematic uh, engagement for a period of at least six months, then they're in. If you're dealing with a carrier who's been engaged for less than uh, six months on a regular and systematic basis, they're out. So again, that's, a, that's an important definition to understand because that might actually mean you're looking at making a change involving somebody who is below that six month regular and systematic hurdle and therefore you might not have some obligations. So again, it's another layer to whether or not this thing applies. So just have that in the back of your mind when we talk about some of these obligations. Uh, this document is primarily focused on when you terminate an owner driver and you'll see there that termination has a very broad definition. Uh, it ceases to enter into contracts of carriage. So in other words, you, you effectively cease to stop providing work. It also includes ceasing to allocate work. And interestingly enough, it also applies where you've got a fixed term contract that is terminating. Um, if you've got a fixed term contract that's 
terminating. Please don't immediately pay the money out in this document. Please come and get some advice. Um, the reason for that is, is that I think there is a reasonable difference between somebody who's on a genuine fixed term contract that uh, operates and ends and disappears. And I think there's a very diff big difference between that and what I see in a lot of owner driver arrangements where Bob is on a rolling five month contract, a five year contract, and they're on their fourth rolling five year contract and they've been moved for 20 years. So um, even though the definition of termination includes when a fixed term contract of carriage comes to an end, uh, don't automatically assume that you're going to be paying money out there. Get some advice because it's important that you check that before you do. And then you'll hear these words a lot about production program, organisation, structure of technology. So this is, this is really about when you're making decisions that impact owner drivers, particularly terminating owner drivers for reasons of changes in production program, organisation, structure or technology. They're very broad words. Uh, they've been given a lot of consideration in the courts over the years. So, for instance, if I decided that I wanted to change from owner drivers to company vehicles, or I wanted to change from owner drivers to using a couple of big fleet operators, or if I was hit by economic circumstances and I realised that I had to reduce the size of my fleet and I was going to terminate owner drivers, uh, those would all be captured by these ideas. If I was going to amalgamate a fleet and in amalgamating it, uh, possibly in a reduced number of owner drivers I engage, again, it would be captured by this notion of changes in production program, organisation, structure or technology. So um, again, let's think about what I said, which is I'm, uh, I'm a hirer, I'm a principal contractor, I engage owner drivers covered by that definition we talked about earlier, and I'm going to make a decision to change my fleet somehow. And the reason I'm changing it is uh, changes in production program, organisation, structure or technology. And I don't get the benefit of any of those get out of jail free cards. So I'm, I'm clearly in the, in the sights of this document. What do I have to do? Well, you've got quite a few obligations under this document. Um, you have an obligation to notify about the change. You have an obligation to discuss the proposed change. If there are possibly going to be terminations of owner drivers, you have an obligation to discuss before terminating. I'll come to that one because that's a separate obligation to the earlier discussion obligation. And then if I am going to terminate owner drivers, I've got an obligation to pay redundancy pay. Now, if you're dealing with employee drivers a lot or employees more broadly in your business, you'll get an immediate sense that looks very similar to your consultation and redundancy obligations that operate in modern awards or many enterprise agreements or under the national employment standards. And it's a very similar theme. So if you're familiar with that, you'll get a, a much better sense about what I'm about to talk about now. Otherwise, let's go through these individual obligations. So the first obligation is a duty to notify. Um, and I put the language up here because I think it's really important to go through. So where a principal contractor has made a definite decision to introduce major changes, I'll come back to that, in production program, organisation, structural technology that are likely to have significant effects on carriers, that's the owner driver, the principal contractor, that's the hirer, shall notify the carriers who may be affected by the proposed change and the union to which they belong. So in my example, um, I, I, I'm, I'm a principal contractor. I've made a decision to restructure my owner driver fleet. Uh, is it a major change? Well, if it applied to one owner driver out of 100, it might not constitute a major change. But if it applies to five out of 20, it's definitely a major change. Um, is it a change uh, in production program, organisation, structure or technology? Well, yes, it is, because I'm actually restructuring my fleet, uh, possibly by reducing some of the owner drivers in it. Will it have significant effects? Well, let's look down at the next dot point because it tells us what they are. Uh, significant effects includes termination of engagement. Remember, I talked about engagements not involving those short-term engagements. 
uh, major changes in the composition, operation or size of the principal contractor's workforce, read fleet for that, or in the skills required, the, the elimination or diminution of job opportunities, promotional opportunities, alteration of hours of work. So if I'm making a, a change in the fleet and there's major changes in the hours of work for my carriers, this obligation would also be triggered. It doesn't just trigger based on termination. It triggers on the basis of significant effect. So I have this duty to notify the carriers affected about the proposed change. So in this case, I would possibly write to them if I was doing it in a, in a formal sense. If I was a smaller operator, I might get them all together and talk to them about the change. That is, folks, look, uh, I'm going to reduce the fleet. I'm, I'm, in, in the next year, I'm moving to go out to tender to get uh, large fleet operators in. I, I have a view that they might manage my chain of responsibility better than dealing with lots of little individual owner drivers. That would be a classic change. And I also have, if they're a member of a union, which of course would be the Transport Workers Union, I have to not only notify the carriers affected, I have to notify the union to which they belong. So that first obligation is to notify in those circumstances where I've made a definite decision to introduce that major change in production program, et cetera, and it will have significant effects. And notice that it says definite decision. It's not, oh, I'm thinking about it. I might do it. I've actually decided I'm going to change the fleet, et cetera, and off we go. So that's the first obligation is to notify. The second obligation is to then discuss the change and the principal contractor is obliged to discuss with those affected carriers, those affected owner drivers. And if there's a union involved, the union, the introduction of the changes, the effects they're likely to have on the carriers, whether or not there's any measures to avert or mitigate uh, the effects. Um, and I've got to give prompt consideration to anything that's raised. So that, that's basically me sitting down and having a chat with them. Uh, in a very large operator, it might be far more formal. Uh, it might involve many, many discussions. Uh, in a smaller operator, it might be sitting down and talking in the yard with the affected carriers. And that might simply be, if you think about what might be measures to avert or mitigate, or that might be about, well, you know, how long is it going to be before you introduce the change? Uh, could you give me till after Christmas? It, it's looking at things like that. And for you to give some consideration to matters that are raised back. It doesn't say you have to agree to what's put back to you. It just says you've got to consider it. Now, you've got to start those discussions on the change as early as practicable after you've made your definite decision. So if you're anxious about uh, uh, spending too much time in these discussions before you make the change, then be mindful of when you are making that definite decision because once you've made that definite decision, then you've got to get into gear. Um, early as practicable is not quite early as possible. So it doesn't mean the instance after you've made your definite decision, but uh, don't dawdle. Uh, uh, you need to get on with it in a uh, practical way. So most people would start those conversations within a matter of days after making the decision. And of course, remember, they've already had an obligation to notify prior to actually discussing the change. You've also got an obligation to provide information about the change. Um, you have to provide it to the affected carriers. And again, if there's a union involved, the union. Um, and that information might be, as is on the slide, what's the nature of the change? What's the expected effect? How many people might it affect? Who are they? Um, the only thing you're not obliged to do is you don't have to hand over confidential information or information that is commercially sensitive that could adversely affect your commercial interests. So uh, there's the notification obligation if you're uh, thinking about making these major changes to program organisation structure, et cetera. There's then the obligation to discuss the change, to take into consideration what's put back to you and to provide information reasonably requested about the change, but it doesn't have to be confidential or information that is commercially adverse to your interests. So that's the what we call the notification and discussion obligations. 
Now, in circumstances where the change is proposed and it might involve um, termination of owner drivers, there is then a second layer of obligation to have further discussions. And these are, interestingly enough, separate to that first set of discussions about the change itself. So we then move on to this notion of uh, obligation to discuss before termination. So I've had my discussions about the change. Uh, the, the carriers uh, have been quite engaged in that conversation, understandably. Um, uh, I've indicated to them at the end of that discussion that I'm proceeding with the change and that in the new year, uh, I will be making some of them, I'll be terminating some of their contracts in the new year because I'm going to go to tender and move to this large fleet owner arrangement. Just by way of example. Um, okay, well, I've made a definite decision that I no longer uh, want the job of the carrier done by anyone. And, and when I say anyone, I mean anyone currently engaged by me. Um, the fact that I might want a fleet owner to do it, don't stress about that. That, that doesn't uh, undermine this notion. So basically, Mr. Owner Driver, Mr. Contract Carrier, um, I, in the new year, I won't be requiring you. I'm doing away with your services. Thank you very much. Uh, the reason for that is a change in how I've structured my fleet, how I've organised it. Um, uh, I now have to have separate discussions with that carrier. And again, if there's a union involved, Transport Workers Union, um, about the terminations. And again, don't be surprised that uh, discussion has to occur as soon as practical after the decision is made uh, in relation to the termination. So normally this conversation would happen post notification, post discussion about the change. I've now confirmed that there will be terminations arising from this proposed change. And now I'm into the discussions before termination. And I'm obliged to have a conversation that covers the reasons for the proposed terminations, a little bit of uh, overlap there with what I've done before, and possible uh, discussion about measures to avoid and minimise the terminations, measures to mitigate any adverse effect of the termination. So, you know, that might be a, a debate about, well, look, you know, do you really need to get rid of six of us in the new year? Perhaps you could stagger it. It might be a conversation uh, about, um, well, look, you know, David's uh, in a particularly difficult position at the moment. Uh, financially, uh, perhaps you could just ha hang on to him for a little while longer. Uh, so that, those are the types of conversations that might come out here. Um, uh, and they're fairly typical conversations that we normally would have. And again, there's an obligation to provide information. And it's very similar to the last set of obligations in that um, you're providing information about the terminations, the proposed terminations, the number, the category, when they're likely to occur. And again, you don't have to disclose confidential information or information that could adversely affect you as the principal, the hirer. So let's assume that I've, 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 I've done my notification. Uh, I've, I've, made, I've made my definite decision to introduce some change to the fleet. It's going to involve reducing the number of uh, owner drivers I've got. I've done my notification. I've had my discussion about change. I've confirmed the decision at the end of that. I've now finished my discussion about the terminations themselves. Uh, I've had a little bit of negotiation about when they're going to come in, but they're definitely coming in in the new year. What do I have to pay them as I am now, in inverted commas, making them redundant? Well, there's a scale that I have to pay them. Um, and bear with me because it's a slightly complicated scale, uh, it, uh, and it, it's got a it's got a it's got a discount factor which I'll come to, but I'll just go through it. And again, for people who are used to dealing with employees, gosh, it looks awfully like uh, an employee scale. Um, it's got a, an under forty five category and over uh, forty five and over category. Um, depending on your years of service, it's got a sort of weeks pay concept in there. So let's just go through it piece by piece. Uh, the first proposition is, is that if the regular driver of the vehicle is under 45, there's a particular scale and that's the first column. 
If the regular driver of the vehicle is 45 years or over, that's the natural person who drives the vehicle, then there's the column on the right-hand side and there's a slightly higher scale. The scale's based on years of service, and as you'll see straight away, if the owner driver who's being made redundant has less than a year's uh, uh, service with you, uh, then they get nothing. Uh, one, it goes then one to two years, two to three years, three to four years, four to five, five to six, and then it tops out at six and over. And you'll see there that uh, the uh, scale operates on the basis of a certain number of weeks pay. So let's just deal with what a week's pay is um, in a moment. So I'm gonna put that to one side, bear with me. I'm gonna to come to a week's pay because it's got a very particular definition. I just wanna focus on what years of engagement are. Now for most of you, whether or not somebody's been with you for one year or two years, uh, that'll just be a matter of record. Uh, if they've been with you uh, for um, a couple of years, but you possibly bought the business from somebody else and the owner driver had been engaged by the old owner, there's a very strong chance that the service they had with the old owner is going to be service that's counted for you. And you'll see we've put on the slide there that there's a particular definition of years of engagement, and it includes the years of engagement of the carrier with a previous principal, where the previous principal contractor has transmitted all or part of its business to the current principal contractor. Now, if you're making major change to a fleet that possibly could involve making these redundancy payments and you did buy the business or acquire the business or have it transferred to you from somebody else, then, then get some advice on that because what you might find is you might be sitting there thinking, well, I'm only up for the, the two-year part of this scale and it's possible that you might be up for the five or the six year part of this scale because of this transmission provision from who you bought or acquired or transferred the business from. And again, remember, this is where the carrier is terminated for reasons arising from changes in production program, organization, organization structure or technology, it's arising from them. So it's not, not I, I'm sacking you because you've breached your contract, um, terminating your contract for that. It's it's in circumstances where, to use the employee language, I don't want you anymore to be doing this job. I'm making you redundant through no fault of your own. And that's because I'm making changes in the way I'm running or managing my business and my fleet. The scale applies. So the $64,000 question is, well, Nigel, what's a week's pay? Uh, so I can work out the calculations. And a week's pay means the weekly average gross remuneration the carrier received from the principal for the previous 12 months for work performed by the carrier on behalf of the principal, less the percentage in the table. Um, so let's say that the, the carrier has worked for you uh, uh, each week over the last 12 months. Um, uh, my rough maths tells me that I, I work out what their gross earnings were for the 12 months. So that's 52 weeks of earnings. I obviously am going to divide whatever the total number is by 52. That gives me a weekly number, a weekly number. And again, it's gross remuneration. I'll come back to that later for one of the questions. Um, and then I have to uh, reduce that by percentage. And the percentage is in the table on the left-hand side. And as you'll see there for smaller vehicles, the percentage is quite low and it gets higher as you go up into the bigger vehicles. And that percentage reduction is, is theoretically a reduction for running costs they will not a, a, a incur. So uh, as a broad sort of rule of thumb, uh, what you end up doing is uh, you end up paying something in the order of about 75% of what they would have earned for each week. Um, so that's a broad, a broad rule of thumb. So um, again, in my example, I've, I've, I've made, made my decision to change my fleet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to a fleet owner. I'm getting rid of some owner drivers. I've gone through notification. I've discussed the change. I've discussed the possible terminations. I'm now calculating the redundancy pay for the people next year when they go. 
I've worked out their years of service. I've worked out if the, the person driving the vehicle regularly is under 45 or 45 and over. And I'm now actually sitting down with my Excel spreadsheet working through what for each of them is a week's pay less this discount amount. And that's how I come up with what they get paid. Now, people often say to me, well, gee, is, is there any way I can, let's say I'm obliged to pay this, is there any way I can get out of paying it? Well, there are two ways you can definitely get out of paying it, but uh, they're, they're not easy ways. If you had an incapacity to pay the money, you could apply to the New South Wales Commission. And that's a formal legal application to ask the commission to allow you to pay nothing or a lesser amount. Now, uh, please don't think of making that application just because you're annoyed by the amount. Um, but if you were in serious economic difficulties, so let's say you were reducing the number of carriers because you were uh, on the verge of insolvency, well, that might be a very good reason to make the application and plead incapacity to pay. There is a second uh, way you can not pay that money if the principal contractor obtains acceptable alternative work for the carrier, um, they can again apply to the commission, the New South Wales Commission, formal legal application, and say, look, given that we found them this work, uh, we shouldn't be required to pay these monies. And a good example, if you think about the example I've used all along, um, I'm, I'm going to get rid of my owner drivers, I'm going to go and use this big fleet owner, and the big fleet owner says, well, gee, Nigel, I wouldn't mind taking three of those people on and actually running them under my banner, uh, actually doing your work. Well, that would be a, a great opportunity to say I found them uh, uh, acceptable alternative work because it's essentially the same work, uh, assuming they're broadly paid the same amount of money for doing the work. Um, I could then uh, run an argument in the commission uh, that those three people shouldn't get the redundancy pay because I found them acceptable alternative work. Those are the two basic ways people who have an obligation to pay these monies might be able to relieve themselves of that obligation. Now, I do want to make a couple of quick comments, I'm conscious of the time. Um, uh, that doesn't wipe out all your other obligations on termination, it doesn't. So just be conscious that you might have uh, obligations, uh, contractual obligations for giving a period of notice as well. And I'm desperately hoping that all of you have written contracts that have express notice provisions in them, because if you don't have written contracts with express notice provisions, then legally you would be up for fair and reasonable notice to terminate a contract. And fair and reasonable notice can be quite long depending on the asset involved and the length of service they've given you. So this redundancy pay doesn't wipe that out. And uh, it's probably a, a conversation for another day, but if, if the owner driver had a goodwill claim against you, that is you've allowed the owner driver uh, to enter your yard by paying a premium to a pre-existing owner driver, and you haven't done that in the legally sensible way, you might also be up for a claim for making good their lost premium, their lost goodwill as well. So just understand that paying that redundancy pay doesn't necessarily wipe out all other obligations you might have contractually or otherwise on termination. So that's that's the New South Wales uh, redundancy state contract termination. That's the one I wanted to spend most of today talking about. And I will very briefly now just quickly touch on the Victorian system in a couple of regards only. Um, and as I say there, just a couple of regards because uh, it's an entirely different system to New South Wales uh, and uh, we could spend a, a webcast on that one alone. But uh, this, this one I want to raise very quickly because it's a bit like people not knowing about the redundancy obligations. There's increasing pressure in Victoria uh, with uh, principal contractors higher as not understanding some of their core obligations in Victoria. Now, Victoria has a system that regulates certain owner drivers. It's similar to New South Wales, but, but in some ways dramatically different because it is, a, is what we call a, 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 a mostly a guideline system rather than a, a statutory obligation system. Um, it, it effectively applies to the sorts of classes that we talked about for New South Wales, be it the uh, sole trader, the partnership, or the, or the little company, 
But the real carve out uh, in Victoria, uh, they're not so concerned about who's driving the truck in Victoria, um, a stranger uh, to the company or a stranger to the sole trader could be driving the truck, as long as the natural person or the corporation is involved in the operation of the business, which means they're driving at least one of the trucks. Um, it doesn't apply if you've got four or more vehicles, that is the little owner driver company or this sole trader partnership has four or more vehicles, you're immediately excluded from the Victorian system. So in the Victorian system, we tend to look at the single owner driver, the double owner driver, the three vehicle owner driver, the minute you get to the four or more vehicle owner driver, little mini fleet, um, they're out of this system. So there's a the cutoff point in Victoria is very, very different. The obligations I wanted to quickly touch on though are these. Um, just be mindful that if you are covered by the Victorian system, you're a higher engaging owner drivers. In New South Wales, of course, we'd say principal contractor engaging contract carriers. You have some very important obligations. When you hire a uh, owner driver in Victoria, um, you've got to provide them with certain things. I apologise for the spelling mistake there. That should be and, not add. Um, you have to provide them with what's called the information booklet and you have to provide them with what are called the most recently published rates and cost schedules and you must do that within three business days of the start of their engagement. The information booklet and the rate and cost schedules are ready, readily available from the uh, Victorian government, Victorian business website. And if you're needing uh, uh, full information on that website, let Nat Rhodes know and we'll sort out making sure that we can give you some links to it. Um, uh, it that, that obligation doesn't apply to short-term operators in, uh, in Victoria. So if you're engaging uh, an owner driver in Victoria for less than 30 days or over a three month period, cumulatively less than 30 days, uh, the obligation doesn't apply. But for those people who are uh, engaging owner drivers on an ongoing basis, just be mindful that at the point of engagement, you have an immediate obligation to provide the information booklet and the most recently published and relevant rate and cost schedule. That rate and cost schedule will uh, possibly be, you'll need to align the best GVM version. Um, the rate and cost schedule is not a legally uh, applicable uh, set of rates like you have in New South Wales, but it is an indication uh, that the owner driver will look at of what uh, should be making up a cost model and therefore a possible rate for their engagement for that type of vehicle. So it is it is informative, it is guiding, um, it's not uh, uh, mandatory to comply with them. Now, the Victorian system gets incredibly more complicated later on if you pay way below all of that, and I say that'll be for another day, but just understand straight away, the important obligation is this obligation to provide the information booklet and the most recently published rate and cost schedule. I'm gonna explain why this is important in about two slides. Uh, be very conscious as well that if you're going to be employing ongoing owner drivers on, on an ongoing basis, that is somebody for more than 30 days, um, uh, uh, something other than a fixed duration contract. You've got to uh, you've got to provide a written contract in Victoria to these people. That written contract must have two provisions in it. There are other things which we could come to and talk about, but we don't have time today. I just want to get these bare minimum things sorted. Um, it must uh, set out the guaranteed minimum number of hours or income that the owner driver is going to receive. And by the way, that could be zero. So normally in our contracts, we say your guaranteed minimum number of hours per year is zero, full stop, and you've met your obligations. Be conscious that, and this is the termination issue, uh, those written contracts also have to set out a minimum period of notice, not, not talking about redundancy pay now, but notice for termination, depending on whether or not you are uh, a, a small uh, running a small vehicle under 4.5 ton GVM or a larger vehicle. And I just want to say this very clearly. So if you, if you, if you let's say you're running um, uh, an eight ton rigid 
your owner driver's running an eight-ton widget and you've employed, you've engaged them in Victoria, uh, they're covered by the owner driver act in Victoria. I've got an obligation to give them that information booklet and that rate schedule when they start. I've got an obligation to make sure they've got a contract in writing that at the very least has the guaranteed minimum number of hours or income in it and at the very least sets out the minimum notice period, which here is three months. And that three-month notice period, the only time it doesn't apply is if I'm terminating that contract for serious misconduct, which again is that sort of major and substantial rip the contract up thing. And understand this, if I want to pay money instead of give the notice, the Act has a particular formula that you must apply. I won't go into today, it's quite complicated, but just be very mindful that if you're engaging people in Victoria, you don't have that redundancy obligation, but you will have this uh, very important set of primary obligations about the information booklet, the rate schedule, a written contract, the minimum hours and income, and the minimum notice period unless we're terminating for serious misconduct. So just be conscious of that. Now, the reason why I raise these before we finish today and go to some quick questions is the Victorian government set up a wage inspectorate a few years ago. That wage inspectorate is empowered to investigate uh, compliance with the owner driver legislation in Victoria. And it is increasingly active. Uh, we deal almost on a regular basis with people who are being visited by that inspectorate. And that inspectorate, the first questions it will ask you is, have you provided the information booklet? Have you provided the rate schedules? The second question is, will be, do you have a written contract? Does it include in it the minimum hours or income? And does it include in it the minimum notice period? And obviously, if you can't say yes to all of those things, you're really exposing yourself to potential fines uh, from the Wage Inspectorate in Victoria. So look, primarily today, I wanted to talk about New South Wales and the redundancy termination, but I didn't want to finish today without just really calling out to NAT Road members, just be mindful if you're operating in Victoria and you're covered by the Victorian owner driver legislation, uh, that there is some really important key obligations you've got to comply with. Otherwise you might get a knock on the door from the Wage Inspectorate and you'll be on the back foot before you start. So just be conscious of that. Now, I think Michelle, that's, that's that's me done. Right. Um, and, and we might, I think there are a few questions that came in. I'm happy to have a go at them if you want. Wonderful. Um, thank you for that. Um, so the first question is, I have a proper commercial contract with my subbies explaining that all entitlements like notice and redundancy are included in the agreed rate. Can these provisions still apply to my business? Um, well, the the... the it's, first of all, like I say, that's, that's a great question. It's also a complicated question, so I'll try and do, I'll try and do it justice in a very short period of time. The, the answer is, whoever you are, the answer could be yes. Um, obviously, if we just think about the New South Wales obligations to begin with, let's use those as the example, not the Victorian ones. Um, obviously, the first thing is, is that we'd have to be uh, comfortable that your subbies, as you describe them, that they are captured as contract carriers, owner drivers under the New South Wales legislation, and that you are properly defined as a principal contractor under that legislation. So the first thing would be, uh, you know, are they are they owner drivers covered by the legislation? And let's assume they are, then I'm going to be honest with you, without reading your contract, you're going to struggle actually creating a an enforceable set off clause for a whole host of reasons. And I'm just going to give one. And you might want to come back to that, Russ, and, and talk about getting some advice on this. I'll, I'll take the redundancy pay as an example. Um, uh, the first thing is, is that uh, most set-off clauses, and what I mean by set-off clauses, you might write in a, a, a commercial contract, uh, the, the rate I'm paying you comprehends A, B, C, D, and F. It's paid, it's paid in consideration of all these things. Um, normally, set-off clauses are have some temporal limitation, some time limitation. So normally we would look at what you are paid in a year and whether or not what you are paid in a year is set off against what you're otherwise owed. Um, uh, that's a real problem with redundancy because redundancy is, is timing triggered and the year I make you redundant, I might owe you 20 weeks pay and I doubt my set off clause in that year is going to be able to set off against 20 weeks. So that's my first concern about what you're trying to do. 
And the second one is you might remember that very unusual definition of week's pay, that actual definition is kind of almost going to defeat you in itself because that definition is um, the, I'm just trying to grab it very, very quickly uh, in front of me, uh, means the weekly average gross remuneration. So the obligation uh, for the week's pay under the determination is your all up rate. So it's going to be hard to create a set off clause that sets you off when you actually are obliged to do the calculation on your all up rate anyway. So uh, I, I, would, I would say, please don't assume that you are uh, blissfully protected by these contracts. I think it will be best if, you, if you're concerned about it to come back to Matt Rhodes and, and look for getting some advice because uh, I, I would be concerned that they are not protecting you fully and you still might have obligations. Michelle? Great, thank you. We've got two more that are very similar and they both apply to um, people employed in Victoria. Um, what if I employ someone in Victoria and they do a run to Sydney, only short-term work? Are they covered by the determination in New South Wales? And then we have another sim question about someone in, um, hired in Victoria but working in Queensland. What obligations are they required to, um, to meet? <clears throat> um, okay, two, two really good questions. Let, let's just start with the New South Wales question. Um, uh, the the new the Vict the first of all, am I covered by the Victorian system? So again, that would be this question of you know the uh, is the person properly described as an owner driver? Are they using one, two, or three vehicles? So we'd have to be looking at that test to make sure that first of all to find it even if they were covered by the Victorian system. Um, what I'm about to say probably applies even if they're not covered by the Victorian system. So let's say that I normally operate in uh, in Victoria, the contracts formed in Victoria, um, I'm, I'm predominantly working in Victoria, and from time to time I nip over the Albury-Wodonga border, uh, drop something off in, in, in New South Wales and then come back. Um, uh, we would have to look at this, what we would technically describe as sort of extra territoriality, this sort of territoriality test. We'd look at where the contract's made. We'd look at where the contract's principally performed. If the contract's made and principally performed in Victoria, I would say the New South Wales determinations wouldn't apply. If on the other hand, um, you, you are principally operating in New South Wales, I think it would be a very different issue and we'd have to explore very carefully whether or not the New South Wales determination applies. Um, I'll give you a good example. Um, uh, we, we, uh, we have a client who's got a quarry in Culcairn, which I understand is in Northern Victoria, and they come across the border and they work principally in New South Wales all day. Um, uh, our view when we looked at that was is that the New South Wales contract determination for quarry materials applies. So it, it will be case by case, but primarily you would say if it's the contracts made in Victoria, they're primarily operating in Victoria, probably no. If, on the other hand, they're in, uh, predominantly working in New South Wales, I would probably lean to yes, but unfortunately we'd have to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, the same question would apply to Queensland. Um, I take it that what's probably happening here is, is that we've got a contract entered into in Victoria and the person is probably doing long haul. Um, uh, I, I, would, I would suggest on the way the Victorian legislation is worded, more likely than not, the Victorian system might apply to them. But I'd, again, I'd really have to look at the, the granular facts of that one to make sure uh, whether or not I, I confirmed that view or, or said no. And just be very mindful, <laughs> uh, Queensland has passed laws that aren't in effect yet, but Queensland is in the process of recreating the New South Wales system for itself under the Queensland Industrial Relations Act. It's passed those laws, but they don't come into effect yet. Um, any other questions, Michelle? Uh, no, that's it. So um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending.
attending today. Um, if you have any other questions, please send an email to info at natroad.com.au and we can pass it on to Nigel. Um, and today's webinar will be uploaded to the Natroad website. So please share it with your colleagues. Um, so thanks again, Nigel, for presenting and everyone enjoy your day. And if I don't speak to you uh, before Christmas, hopefully everybody have a safe and Merry Christmas. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.